those who live in death should be left well alone. What's up guys, welcome back. If you enjoyed this video, do us a solid and smash the like button. And if you want to see more videos like this, then feel free to subscribe. Today we're going to be covering a one-shot mage build that actually gives the carry and grander build we put together a run for its money. Now being a death mage, this build's going to focus around the death's poker and then the best spells from the death school sorceries. Now given the fact that most of this build can be played from a range and when you do go into melee with the death's poker, the damage is so absurd, we don't need to hit the 60 soft cap on vigor, you should be more than fine at 50. Now obviously with these stats, I want you to play where you feel the most comfortable. So if you don't care so much about one-shotting everything in the game and you don't mind killing things in 2 or 3 hits, then feel free to take 10 points from intelligence and pump them into vigor to hit that soft cap and make this build really tanky. For mind I only went 14 so again if you wanted more convenience than damage here you could sprinkle some points there. I went 22 endurance so that we could still medium roll in Malachith's armor while hitting that 51 poise breakpoint. Strength and dexterity I just put enough for us to be able to use the death's poker. And then intelligence is our main damage stat on this build, and it happens to soft cap at 80 for both our weapon and for our staff. We only had to go to 23 faith to be able to use the Hall of Shaburi buff because we use the faith not crystal tier, and arcane we just leave at base. Now before continuing to weapons, I want to take a minute to thank this video's sponsor. If you're looking for a game with awesome champions, challenging PvE bosses, and tactical PvP content, this game is a must play for you. If you've been on the fence about playing Raid Shadow Legends, now's the time to join the other 5 million monthly active users in celebrating Raid's 5th anniversary and take advantage of the numerous updates that Raid has incorporated to escalate your experience. Dive into the Cursed City to clear stages each month to earn valuable rewards, like a free mythical champion and defeat Amius the Lunar Archon. Enjoy the powerful new rarity of Champion, which can use metamorph skills to transform between two forms, bringing high levels of power, versatility, and utility. Enter the live arena to show off your tactical prowess by fighting other players in real time, picking and banning champions before diving into a 4v4 fight to the death. In celebration of Raid's 5th anniversary, you'll receive two epic heroes just by using my link and the promo code FESTIVAL5, something I wish I'd received when I started playing. There are all sorts of awesome combat encounters in Raid, like boss fights that make you take on two bosses simultaneously. And if you're like me and you like fighting bosses, there are plenty of them in this game for you to test your skill set on. The combat system is a great change of pace from what I'm used to, it's a great way to mix things up from my normal gaming genre. New players will receive tons of awesome in-game loot and the champion Tyrol when using promo code FESTIVAL5. Once you're in and crushing enemies, come find me under the name Titus Actual YT and join my clan, the Titus Actual Legion, so we can destroy enemies and become legends together. Now when it comes to weapons with this build, you actually have some flexibility. You can either fight with your weapon in melee range or you can cast spells from a distance. Now obviously the bread and butter of the build is the Death's Poker. And this is dropped by the Death Rite Bird in Southeastern Kaled. If you followed our OP early guide, you should already have this. We showed a method to cheese him without having to fight him. I'm going to talk about this weapon in more detail after introducing the other two. Now for our spells, we're going to use Lusat's Glinstone Staff because it's the best intelligence scaling staff in the game. You can feel free to use the Carrion Regal Staff while exploring to save on some FP. And you can find this staff in a chest just behind the Nox duo fight in Celia Town of Sorcery. Then we're going to grab the Golden Order Seal. Now this is just ground loot in the Minor Erd Tree Church in the capital outskirts. And the sole purpose of this is to just give us a seal that we can use to cast our Howl of Shabriri. And we won't be using it for damage, we'll be using it just for the buff so the scaling on the seal does not matter. Now the Death Spoker scales off of Strength, Dexterity, and Intelligence. And the scaling is so-so, leaving you with around 520 damage or so on the weapon. But the skill on the weapon is called Ghost Flame Ignition, and that scales incredibly well with intelligence. And as you've seen, this is one of the highest damage skills in the game. And though it looks like fire damage, it's actually magic damage. And even better, it causes Frostbite buildup as well. So if you're unfamiliar with Frostbite, Frostbite is similar to Bleed in that there's an invisible meter that once you build it up to 100% will proc a Frostbite. And procking a frostbite on a boss will instantaneously remove 7% of their health 
plus 30 additional HP. Now an added bonus to Frostbite over Bleed is that once you proc a Frostbite, it applies a debuff to that enemy for 30 seconds where they take 20% more damage from all sources. Now in order to see how much frost buildup you need in order to proc a frostbite, you just look up how much frostbite resistance a boss has, and then you would just need to cross that threshold with the amount of frost buildup that you do. And that's where the death's poker is so special. While hitting the enemy with a normal attack from the weapon only does like 65 frostbite buildup, the Ghost Limb Ignition skill causes 650 frostbite with just the initial L2 animation. Now if you follow up that L2 with the R2 explosion version of Ghost Limb Ignition, you'll get over 850 frostbite buildup. And if you were to instead follow up the L2 with an R1, you would see over 2,000 Frostbite buildup with one Ghost Slam Ignition. And this is of course assuming that all of the ticks hit the enemy. Now the way that spell damage is calculated in this game, you should be able to use any spell in the game that you want with this build. But sticking with the death theme, this is what I chose. Explosive Ghost Flame is probably the highest damage death spell in the game. And you get this for killing the death right bird on the northwest side of Ordina. And this is just at the very end of the Frozen River. And this spell is a giant AoE explosion followed up by an AoE damage over time effect. Ancient Death Ranker is another pretty strong death spell. This summons 9 spirit skulls that'll track down and attack your target. This spell is chargeable and you get it for killing the death right bird in Liurnia just east of the academy. And this is a pretty decent ranged option. Tibia Summons is a pretty cool spell. Honestly I threw it in the build for the novelty of it. You get this for killing the Tibia Mariner in the Windham Ruins. Now this spell looks really cool to use, and the damage isn't bad, but there's probably way better ranged options out there. The skeletons sometimes have trouble tracking moving targets. Those coming from the OP early guide already have this spell. I always grab Night Comet early on. All you need to do is go and light the Brazers and Celia. And in my opinion, this is one of the best ranged spells in the game. It's super convenient, it's not too FP heavy, and you get it very early on. Now for this build, I went with Malakid set because it hits the 51 poise breakpoint. It looks fantastic and it falls perfectly in line with our death theme. The first piece is Malakit's Greaves that gives us 14 poise. The second piece is Malakit's Gauntlets, this gives us 5 more poise pushing our total up to 21. The third piece is Malakit's Armor which adds 24 more poise pushing our total up to 43 poise. And the last piece is Malakit's Helm which adds 8 poise pushing our total up to 51. Picking up Malakit's set is pretty straightforward, all you need to do is go and defeat him and then it will become available for purchase at the round table hold. Now as always with any of our builds, you can feel free to use whatever armor you want. I just recommend at least hitting that 51 poise breakpoint, but this armor's sick, you should definitely consider it. Now for talismans, only the first three are really mandatory for the build, the other two you can kind of swap out with whatever you wanted to. Now the first one's a talisman that every mage build should be using and that's the magic scorpion charm. Now this increases all magic damage that you do by 12%, whether it's weapon or spell based. You get this as part of Selva's questline, you're going to need to give him 2 starlight shards and an amber starlight in order for him to give it to you. Whenever you find yourself using the spells in this build, you're going to want to be using the Graven Mass Talisman. This is located in the Albanark Rise on the east side of the Frozen River and Consecrated Snowfield. And remember you're going to need the Fanged Imp Ashes, the Bewitching Branch, or some Crystal Darts in order to solve the puzzle and gain access to the Rise. You're going to want to grab the Shard of Alexander because it'll boost the damage of your Ghost Flame Ignition on your Death Poker by 15%. And obtaining this is pretty straightforward, he's going to give it to you at the end of his quest line. To get to this point, all you really need to do is exhaust his dialogue after Radon and then again in Mount Kelmir. Now the first optional but highly recommended talisman is the Ritual Sword Talisman. This increases all damage that you do by 10% while you're at full health. All you need to do is defeat Demi-Human Queen Gillica in Altus Plateau and then when you open up the door behind her, it'll be in a chest inside. Now another great optional but highly recommended talisman would be the Dragon Crest Great Shield Talisman. This talisman reduces all incoming physical damage by 20%. This adds a ton of survivability and it's great for general exploration. And you can find this in Elfiel on the way down to Melania in a chest guarded by pests. One of the best parts of the build is how frightening you can get this damage with very few buffs. I only have three mandatory buffs for this build. The first of which is Hal of Shabriri. Hal of Shabriri increases all of your damage by 25%. And you could get this extremely early on, it's just in a chest in the Frenzy Flaming Tower in Liurnia. And this buff will affect both your spells and your skills. The only other buff that's mandatory per se would be the Rallying Standard. And this is just a skill on the Commander Standard, and it increases all damage by 20% for 30 seconds. And this is really easy to get, all you need to do is kill Commander O'Neill in Eastern Kaelid. Now an optional but still highly recommended buff for this build would be Terra Magica. This spell places a glyph on the ground, and as long as you're standing in it, it raises all your magic damage by 35%. And this spell is located in a chest up the elevator behind the Crystallian Duo in the Academy Crystal Cave. Now obviously the first flask tier that I recommend is the Magic Routing Crack tier. 
This will raise all magic damage, so essentially all of your damage with this build by 20%. And you actually get access to this pretty early. All you need to do is kill the Erdtree Avatar that's in Eastern Laernia. Now, if you're not using Hall of Shabir, use whatever second tier you want. But if you are, you're going to want to get the Faith Knot Crystal tier. And this will raise your faith by 10 for 3 minutes, allowing you to use Hall of Shabriri. And you can actually get this really early as well. This is just ground loot on the northern side of Weeping Peninsula, a couple seconds ride south of where you started the game. There's a ton of consumables that'll scale well with this build, but the only one that I would say is really mandatory is Sleep Pots. These make some of the harder fights in the game, like the Godskin Duo, absolutely trivial. And you actually gain access to crafting these after grabbing the Fever's Cookbook 1. And that's just located in the graveyard just south of Summon Water Village in Limgrave. Then you just need mushrooms and Trina's lilies. Now if you're still here, that means you're enjoying the video. If you haven't smashed that like button, you should do so now. And if you're looking for a written checklist version guide of this build, all of that stuff is over on our Patreon. So whether you're just looking to support the channel a little bit, or you're looking for access to those custom guides, the link to our Patreon will be in a clickable element at the end of this video or in the description or pinned comment below. Also be sure to let us know in the comment section below what build you want to see as a one-shot build next or any other Elden Ring or Dark Souls content that you'd like to see. Now typically we show the one-shot buff routine on a really extreme example to completely min-max the damage, but the problem is that people skip through the videos, they don't watch the buff section, and then they think that you need to do all of that in order to make the build work. Since 99% of you are not doing a one-shot challenge and you don't care if you have to hit a boss twice, I'm going to start showing you the regular buff routine that I recommend with the very quick 2 or 3 recommended buffs from the buff section, and honestly, just the Hallow Shabarian Commander Standard should be enough for you to one-shot most of Elden Ring with the Death's Poker. But something new that we're going to start doing in these build videos from now on is I'm going to pick up where the OP Early Guide left off. And I'm going to show you how I played through the game as if it was a one-shot challenge run. So be sure that you've watched the entirety of that OP Early Guide. And once your character's at the end of that guide, we're going to pick up where you left off right now. Okay, so the first thing we did was we went and got a Memory Stone and a couple Stone Sword Keys at the Round Table Hold. Then I grab a dagger later on just in case for some reason I wanted to try tumble buffing. Then we're going to head down to the Weeping Peninsula and get the Faith Knot Crystal tier. And from here I'm going to go to Northeast Lyernia and I'm going to get the Howl of Shaburi. Really at this point I'm just trying to stack up buffs early on so that I can get through Godric. Since I need a seal in order to cast Howl of Shaburi, I grab the Golden Order seal. It scales with intelligence although that doesn't really matter. Then I went back to Fort Ferreth and I farmed the dragon a couple more times and leveled up. Now obviously you can level up as much as you want here, my goal is just to get to 60 intelligence to hit the soft cap and 23 faith so that with the faith not crystal tier we had 33 to use Hall of Shabiri. You could definitely spend a couple more minutes and level up vigor if you want to. Now I head over to the Altus Plateau and I can easily one shot Demihuman Queen Gillica with just the commander standard Hall of Shabiri and my flask. And the only reason we're actually here right now is because this boss is gatekeeping the ritual sword talisman. And we're going to use this to gain 10% more damage while we're at full health, which for most boss fights that should be the case. And speaking of boss fights, we're going to jump straight into one. So we're going to go fight Royal Knight Loretta. But I'm going to show you a way to cheese this boss that you probably haven't seen before. So this is actually really easy to pull off. All you need to do is start the fight. And then you need to run up to this corner that I'm running to. And then when you get there, you're just going to quit out and then load back in. And it'll be super obvious that you did it because when you turn around, Loretta will be spawned in, but her AI will be broken. And I wanted to show it this way because we need to get past her, but I know a lot of people are going to have an issue with her jumping around. Also, just for reference, if you wanted to replicate the buffs but it's a little too fast for you, just remember that YouTube allows you to lower the playback speed all the way down to 25%. Just use the little gear icon on the bottom of the video. So now at this point, we have access to Ronnie, so you're going to want to choose to serve Ronnie the Witch. Then we're going over to Celevis' tower and we're going to accept his task, but we don't actually have to give Nefeli the potion. We're going to progress our questline though because we definitely want the Ancient Dragon Smithing Stone. And then while you're here, don't forget to grab the right half of the Hollow Tree Secret Medallion. Then head back to the round table where you should have no problem dispatching Encha of the Royal Remains. And this gives us early access to a very good and what I consider a very fitting armor set for a death build. I mean, just looking at it, you see it too, right? So next you're going to want to head over to the Nomadic Merchant over on the coast by the first steps. And we're going to buy the Armor's Cookbook 2, which gives you access to crafting neutralizing boluses. And then because I'm lazy, I also just buy the five neutralizing boluses he sells as well. And don't forget to go back and kill that Omen Killer to progress Nefeli's questline. So now it's time to take on Godric, and you're just going to use the very simple 3-step buff routine that we've been using. Don't forget to take off the Commander Standard when you enter the fight so that you can medium roll. And if you're curious how we got Terra Magica, remember that we grabbed a lot of this stuff in the OP early guide, so go watch that before doing this. You should have no problem one-shotting Godric at this point. As you can see, we actually overkilled him by quite a bit with almost 10,000 damage. Now, I was just trying to get through and make this guide as fast as possible, but you should go and activate Godric's Great Rune at this point. 
Then in order to progress Celevis's questline, we're gonna hand the potion over to Gideon to dispose of. I prefer this option because it gives us the opportunity to progress both Celevis and Nefeli's questlines. Now to progress Celevis's questline, we need two Starlight Shards. I grab the one on the southern tip of Limgrave and the one by the Church of the Plague. But any two Starlight Shards that you grab are fine. You're also gonna grab the Amber Starlight. And this is just in that little alcove by the Altus Highway Junction. Then you need to go to Celevis's hidden cellar and find his puppets. Then return to him and accept the Jarrite puppet. It's the more expensive of the two, so you want that one first. Then you're going to tell him that you want another puppet. And this is where you're going to use your Starlight Shards to purchase the Finger Maiden puppet. As you can see now that you couldn't see earlier, this one's only two Starlight Shards. The other one would have costed three. Then just progress his dialogue and give him the Amber Starlight. And then after all of this, you finally get the Magic Scorpion Charm. This is an awesome, basically 12% damage boost to all aspects of our build. Now at this point I went back to the Church of Ella and I bought the three crack pots ahead of time so I'd have some throwables later. And then I purchased the crafting kit so that I could start crafting things. Now this part's completely optional and we didn't end up using this item in the run, but if you want to, here's a really cool way to get to Rena's Rise early with a zip. Now if you're on console, there's a way to get over here with Torrent as well, but the jumps are really tricky and I just did not have the patience to line it up for the video. Especially when, like I said, we really don't need access here at this point, so this is completely optional. But if you did choose to do this, you'll now be at the Ainsel River Main, you're just going to progress through until you get to the Lake of Rot. And when you get to the Lake of Rot, just be sure that you grab the Lake of Rot Shoreline Site of Grace. And now you have access to come back here whenever you want. We're after a specific item, but again, we don't end up using it. Before navigating the Lake of Rot, go and grab Flame Cleanse Me. Now this is going to remove all Scarlet Rot from you instantaneously, and it makes navigating the Lake of Rot very easy. Now in order to utilize this, we're going to need a lot of FP, so we're going to allocate our Flash Charges so it's half Crimson and half Cerulean Tears. Now this is completely optional as well, but if you want to use Night Comet, you can quickly kill this enemy. They're going to drop the Immunizing Horn Charm plus one. And the only place you'd really use this is down here because it'll raise your resistance against Scarlet Rot buildup. So I recommend just grabbing it and then quickly warping back to the Lake of Rot side of Grace and starting over. Now you should have no problem navigating your way around the Lake of Rot. Don't forget to grab this Somber Smithing Stone 8, it's conveniently right along the path that we're taking. And then the reason we came down here is actually for the Mushroom Crown. And this just gives you a 10% damage buff after being poisoned. But by the time that you actually use in this run, you would have been able to one-shot Radon anyways. So at this point, I wanted to spice the run up a little bit by using something other than Death's Poker the whole time. So I came up with this creative way to go and one-shot the Tibia Mariner. Now obviously the reason we're here is because we want Tibia Summons. And I have kind of mixed feelings on this spell. On one hand, it does look really cool, and it does respectable damage. I just feel like there's much stronger spells without any downsides to choose from. Because this one just really does not perform well against moving enemies. By the time that the three skeletons swing, the enemy's already long gone and they completely- So now we're already to a point where you see why I buy stone sword keys any chance I see at a vendor. We need a stone sword key to unlock the Seedwater Cave. And in here, we're just after the boss, which is the Kindred of Rot duo. They have pretty low HP, so it really shouldn't be much of a challenge. If you use Ghost Swim Ignition in that simple three-step buff routine, you should be able to one-shot them for like 200% their health. And they're gonna drop the Kindred of Rot's Exaltation Talisman. And this talisman raises all of your attack power by 20% for 20 seconds after any poisoning or rot occurs in the vicinity of your player. Now that includes poisoning yourself with a fetid pot, which you can do very quickly and conveniently outside of boss fog gates. Now at this point we're going to progress White Mask Var's questline, so go meet him at the church in Liernia and tell him that the two fingers didn't seem right. They'll reward you with the festering bloody finger, and you can use these in the Red Blood Ruins to invade Magnus the Beast Claw. Now this NPC is super aggressive, so buffing's kind of a pain. As you can see, it's definitely possible though, just do it as you're running away. And the one shot's pretty easy actually, because they have very low poise, so go some ignition staggers them. But if you're struggling here, don't worry, if you die to them three times, you automatically progress the quest anyways. Conveniently, you also get a somber smithing stone 6 here, which we're going to need to upgrade our staff. When you get back to the church, just go ahead and choose anoint me, and you'll be given the Lord of Blood's favor, which is the final task to complete this quest line. Now the easiest way to do this is to go to the Church of Inhibition and dye the cloth with the Maiden's Blood there. Just be prepared to hug the cliff all the way around to the backside of the church or be prepared to fight Fingerprint Vikir. And when you get back to turn this in, you're going to be rewarded with the Pure Blood Knight's Medal. And this is a big deal because now very early in the game we have access to get to Mogwin's Palace. So go ahead and use this and it's going to transport you to the middle of Mogwin Palace. It's very important that before you do anything here that you run up and grab the map inside of Grace just ahead of you. This way, if you die here, you just respawn at this site of grace, you're still in Mogwin Palace, and you also have a place to fast travel back to. So go ahead and make your way forward towards Mog's Arena, and grab the somber Ancient Dragon Smithing Stone out of the chest just before the arena. This will let you upgrade your Death's Poker to plus 10, 
If you go back to Kaelid on the north side of that bridge in Dragon Barrel, there's going to be another Scarab with a Somber Smithing Stone 9. Just be careful for this sneaky little vulgar militiaman that I didn't see. And we're picking up other Somber Smithing Stones 1 through 9 so that we can start to upgrade our staff as well. At this point, I went to the Blacksmith and I used that Somber Ancient Dragon Smithing Stone to upgrade my Death Poker to plus 10. And then I stopped in the graveyard just south of Summon Water Village in Limgrave to grab the Fever's Cookbook 1 so that I could craft Sleep Pots. Go ahead and grab some mushrooms and Trina's lilies and craft at least one or two of these for the upcoming fight. And then start making your way through the academy. I just went ahead and grabbed that somber smithing stone 3 by the entrance. Ride the elevator all the way down to the bottom of the academy and let the abductor virgin eat you. If you have any sort of substantial amount of runes, I recommend either spending them first a level or use a sacrificial twig or something. This teleports us to Volcano Manor where we can go ahead and start grabbing some more somber smithing stones. Grab the somber smithing stone 6 on the rooftop as soon as you jump down and then grab the Somber Smithing Stone 5 after taking the elevator up. After unlocking the bridge, we're just going to head straight into the Godskin Noble Boss fight. Again, all you need here is your flask, your two buffs, and a sleep pot. You could definitely do this without the sleep pot, but this just makes it really easy. It buys us time to go ahead and use Terra Magica and easily one-shot him. Now we just need to get past him, and there's actually a skip for this fight, but it's just much easier at this point to come in and one-shot him than skipping him. Just progress your way through towards Rikard, and then you're going to use a Stone Sword key to go in and grab Royal Knight's Resolve. We want Royal Knight's Resolve in case we come across something later on with super high resistance where we want a Tumble Buff, because the Tumble Buff would send our Death's Poker damage through the roof. After opening the shortcut and grabbing the main Volcano Manor Site of Grace, come back and grab the Somber Smithing Stone 7, but be careful because there's a Virgin Abductor guarding it. At this point, I went to the Smoldering Church, which is on the border of Limgrave and Kaelin, and I grabbed the Missionary's Cookbook 3. This lets you craft Silver Pickled Foul Feet. From here I went to Jarberg, which is just that little place you can jump down on the very east side of Liernia by the tower. And there's a ton of renewable farmable crafting materials here, as well as several cracked pots. So just out of convenience while I was in Liernia, I went to the converted tower and grabbed the memory stone there. Then I went to the 4th Church of America on the south side of Weeping so that I could farm some 4-toed foul feet to craft silver pickle foul feet. I grabbed some silver fireflies over at the Ansel River main. And if you didn't come here yet, you can always farm these in caves in Limgrave, Weeping Peninsula, and Lyrnia of the Lakes. Then go ahead and craft Silver Pickle Foul Feet. Odds are you're going to need a couple of them. But keep in mind, if you're not trying to one-shot every boss, this is completely optional as well. Basically, what we're doing is we're farming a Black Dumpling Helm. And this route is the most efficient way to do it, but even with the Silver Pickle Foul Feet, the drop rate's pretty low. And it always sucks to rely on RNG when farming stuff, but just be patient. I got mine after just a couple minutes. Basically, this item's gonna go at the very beginning of our buff routine right after our flask. So if we wear this and we proc madness, it's gonna raise all of our damage by 10% for 60 seconds. I wanted to add another spell at this point, so I went to Liernia just east of the academy, used our little 3 buff setup plus Terra Magica, and one shot the Death Right Bird. And this will give you access to Ancient Death Rancor, which is pretty cool because it's like a heat seeking spell. It'll track enemies that move around a lot and it'll hit them multiple times. It's a very cool looking spell, and it's a very convenient spell. The damage is pretty decent and it's chargeable, so it'll one-shot a lot of bosses, but it won't one-shot the really big endgame bosses. At this point, I want to start using some spells so that I could get some variety in the intro for this video for you guys. And to do some respectable damage with that, I had to go and get Lusat's Glenstone Staff. So in order to do this, I went and one-shot the Nox Duo in order to get access to that Lusat's Glenstone Staff that's in the chest right behind them. And smaller, faster enemies like this that move around a lot is where Ancient Death Ranker shines because it'll track them. Also, as you saw, a neat trick when you're using ranged spells in these boss fights is to throw down your Terra Magica right before going through the fog door. Now, because we went and got all the difficult somber smithing stones, now that we have the Lusat's Glenstone Staff, we can basically go and upgrade it almost to max right away. The only smithing stones you should be missing is a 1, 2, and a 4, which you can actually buy at EG. And if you didn't pick up that somber smithing stone 3 at the academy, you can buy that with him as well. So go ahead and make your way over to EG, you should have his Sight of Grace from earlier in the game. And just purchase whatever Sober Smithing Stone 1-4 through 4 you need, you should have 5-9 through 9 already. Then go ahead and upgrade your Lusat's Glenstone Staff all the way up to plus 9. If you need runes, remember that we have access to the bird farm at Mogwin Palace. So just utilize that whenever you need runes. At this point I grabbed some more extravagant buffs just in case I needed them, because remember I was doing this one shot playthrough completely blind. So while I was here in Lyernia, I went and one shot the Death Bird down south by the Lyscar Ruins. And I always do this early in my one-shot challenge runs because he drops a red feathered branch sword. And this is a talisman that'll raise your damage by 20% when your health is below 20%. So you'll sub that out for the ritual sword talisman whenever you hit a wall on your damage where you need a little bit more. 
And while we're planning ahead, we're also going to go and one-shot the Bloodhound Knight in the Lakeside Crystal Cave. And you can do this really easily with Ancient Death Ranker, which is really convenient for agile bosses. And really the main reason that we're here is we want access to Latena's questline. So just make your way back to her behind the boss fight and hear her request. And really we're just progressing her questline now so we don't forget, so we don't miss out on that somber Ancient Dragon Smithing Stone later. Also while we're in preparation mode, we're going to go and we're going to one-shot Esgar. Now this boss is very fast and he can be tricky, but if you use Ghost Slam Ignition and use the R2 explosion variation, it should kill him before he does anything. And it should also be noted that when he dies, the dogs will also die instantaneously. He gives us the Lord of Blood's Exaltation, which we're going to stash for later. It's a buff that gives us 20% more damage for 20 seconds when blood loss occurs near us. From here, I decided I would just go and grab another really easy memory stone by one-shotting the Red Wolf of Radagon. He has pretty low HP, so it's not really tricky. Just try to bait out his big jumping attack. And although this opens up Renala, I actually opted against going and killing her at this point because she has incredibly high magic resistance, which would mean that we would have a really hard time one-shotting her with this build, and there's much easier great runes to get. Now, though I didn't fight Renala, I did go that direction to show off the Tibia summons against Moongrim, because I was taking any opportunity I could to build the highlight reel. Now that our damage is high enough, there's really no reason not to progress and one-shot Golden Shade Godfrey, especially since he's gatekeeping our third talisman slot, which would boost our damage quite significantly. And the trick to making this fight easy is to buff near the door and then aggro the fight and bait him back towards your Terra Magica, then just dodge his axe throw and immediately turn around and cast Ghost Slam Ignition. And if you follow those steps, it's a pretty easy one shot and now we have access to your third talisman pouch. So depending on what talisman we put in that slot, it gives us anywhere from 10 to 20% more damage. At this point, we need to make our way to patches. And don't forget, anytime you get invaded by a really agile NPC that gives you a hard time, you could just throw on a couple buffs, throw down Terra Magica, and make very short work of them with Ancient Death Ranker. Now, if you accidentally kill patches, don't stress. You can always take his bell bearing to the round table hold and buy everything still. But I recommend just hitting him with a couple Night Comets, having him surrender, and then you can gain access to him as a vendor if you just choose Forgive and Forget. Now in order to get the option to purchase from him, you do have to reload the area and run back down here. I would always recommend buying the 3 Gold Pickle Falfi that he sells for 600 because they're always going to pay dividends. And then obviously buy the Missionary's Cookbook too so that you can craft more Gold Pickle Falfi at any time you want. This will significantly boost any rune farming that you do. But the main reason that we're here is to buy Margit's Shackle. And because this works on Morgoth, this makes a very difficult fight with a very fast and high HP boss into a trivial one. Because you can just use this to hold Morgoth in place. So I'm actually going to show this full buff routine in real time so that you guys can see that you don't need the Mushroom Crown. You actually do so much overkill damage here too that you don't even need the Black Dumpling. So if you didn't feel like farming the Black Dumpling, you do not need that for this. You'll see that I do the typical buff routine where I use the Flask and then I proc Madness with the Black Dumpling. Then I just use my standard as normal. And while I do switch to the Mushroom Crown before poisoning myself, you'll see that that doesn't matter because it actually cancels itself out because I forgot to heal up for my Ritual Sword Talisman. And since they're both 10%, if I would have just healed up here and not had the Mushroom Crown, I would have had the exact same 10% from the Ritual Sword Talisman. So after using Margit Shackle, you can use Terra Magica and then use the R2 variation of Ghost Slim Ignition. Or you can skip Terra Magica, run up, and immediately do the R1 variation of the Ghost Swim Ignition, and probably do 15 to 20,000 damage even without the Black Dumpling. Don't forget to grab the Roll Medallion before leaving the area for access to the mountaintops of the Giants. And since Morgoth gave us our second Great Rune, we can go back to the Round Table and buy our fourth Talisman Pouch, and this will scale our damage even higher. At this point, we're going to head to the Grand Lift of Rolled, and we're going to use that Medallion to head up to the mountaintops. The first thing I always do is I come and grab Seppuku from the Frozen Lake. If we throw this on a sword, we can use it to proc a bleed to activate our Lord of Blood's Exaltation and White Mask buffs. While you're here, you might as well grab the Somberstone Miner's Bell Bearing 3 in case you wanted it later. And don't forget about the 3 stack of Smithing Stone 7s above the church. At this point, I did the Consecrated Skip. You can do this on console or PC, it doesn't matter. You basically just use the Spirit Spring to jump off the map, and then you jump left when the camera changes like it just did there. Then you're just going to free fall until you get down to the bottom of that mountain, and then you're just going to leave the game and load back in. And when you load in, it'll save Mountaintops of the Giants, but you're actually down in the Consecrated Snowfield now. And you'll see that when you take a couple steps forward here. If you need a more detailed description, we have an entire video on just this skip on my wife's channel, and that's YouTube at Emberborn. But basically from here, you're just going to follow my path to navigate your way down these rocks. And when you get to the bottom, you're just going to use the Waygate there, and that's going to take you over to the Minor Erd Tree. And from the Minor Erd Tree, you just ride down the hill and grab the Sight of Grace at Ordina. And grabbing the Sight of Grace is extremely important. I can't stress that enough, so you don't have to redo this skip later. You always have a fast travel point here in the Consecrated Snowfield. 
So at this point, I went back to the round table to buy a rapier as a very lightweight option to put Seppuku on. So now I can use this to proc Lord of Blood's Exaltation if I hit a wall where I need a little more damage. And then to add to that buff, I also went back to Mogwim Palace and I one-shot the Nameless White Mask. And again, even if you're one-shotting everything with Death's Poker, you probably won't need this. But remember, I need to grab everything I can in case I need it later because I'm going through this run blind and I don't know what kind of damage walls I'm going to run into. So I'm just grabbing every extra buff early on in case I may need it later. Now the White Mask works very similar to the Lord of Blood's Exultation in that whenever blood loss occurs in the vicinity of the player, you'll get a 10% damage buff for 20 seconds. It should also be noted that it stacks with Lord of Blood's Exultation. Also, now that we have access to Consecrated Snowfield, we should come over here to the Apostate Derelict and finish Lieutenant's questline. This will get us a Somber Ancient Dragon Smithing Stone, which we can use on our loose ass Glenstone Staff whenever we feel like we need a little bit more damage. Also, if you didn't know, there's a Somber Smithing Stone 9 on a chair just a couple feet away as well. Now with access to Consecrated Snowfield, we also gain access to the Death Rite Bird at the end of the Frozen River. And this is going to be the highest health Death Rite Bird that we're going to fight, but you should still have no problem one-shotting it with the Ghost Slam Ignition if you just follow what I did here. And again, remember, if the buff routine's too fast for you, just use YouTube to slow it down to 25%. Now we can start mixing things up a little bit because this Death Rite Bird is going to give us access to Explosive Ghost Flame. And Explosive Ghost Flame is the highest damage death spell in the game. It does a huge AoE explosion that does very high damage. And then it does lingering tick damage similar to the R1 on Death's Poker, but it does it in every direction. Now honestly, you probably could have easily come and one-shot Radon any point past like Golden Shade God for your Morgat most likely. And the only reason that I'm coming back to do it now is because I need to progress Alexander's quest line, so I have to talk to him after defeating Radon. So if you one-shot Radon earlier and you already talked to Alexander here, then don't worry about this part. Then to progress his quest, we need to talk to Alexander in the lava over at Mount Gelmir. And then the last thing you need to do to get Alexander moved to his final location is kill the Fire Giant. Now because Ghostly Ignition is a damage over time spell and the Fire Giant automatically transitions at a certain point of health, you're not going to be able to straight up one-shot him like you did with Carrion Grander, which is one big hit, but you can easily one-shot each phase as I showed here. Honestly, if you're having a hard time with him, just stay mounted on Torrent and stick to his left ankle staying underneath him the whole time and you should make the fight very easy. His attacks are very easy to dodge while you're underneath him. Because I've just been putting points into intelligence as I had extra runes, I would show that I'm nowhere near maxed out at 80 intelligence yet. And remember that 33 faith is because I get 10 extra faith from the faith not tier. So now it's time to commit a cardinal sin and travel over to Crumbling Fire Missoula. Don't forget to pick up the Somerstone Miner's Bell Bearing 4 in case you want it later. And be sure to grab at least one side of grace here so you can fast travel back. At this point I went back to the academy to the isolated merchant and I bought the Fanged Imp Ashes. And we're not using this on a boss, I'm just using this to help get the Graven Mass Talisman. And that's because I just think that this is the easiest way to solve the puzzle for the Albinoric Rise. So then just work your way to the top of the Rise and grab the Graven Mass Talisman. And this will boost the damage of all of our sorceries by 8%. And I wanted to use spells as much as possible to spice the run up a little bit. Now since we're trying to boost the damage of our sorceries, another way we can do that is upgrading our Lusat's Glenstone Staff to plus 10. And then as usual, we can make the Godskin Duo fight much simpler by using a Sleep Bot and then doing all of our buffs. And you should have around 60 seconds to pull off all these buffs, so you shouldn't have any issue before they wake up. And then this is the first opportunity I had to really showcase off how much damage Explosive Ghost Flame can do. So this sort of gives a good visual illustration as to why I say Explosive Ghost Flame is the strongest death spell in the game. Because if they had more health, they would have taken even more damage from all the ticks. But on all these fights, remember you can also use Ghost Flame Ignition to achieve similar results. Well, actually most of the time better results. So now in order to finish Alexander's quest line, we're going to need a stone sword key and we're going to take the elevator up to him. Go ahead and finish through his dialogue to the point where he tells you to return when you're ready to fight him. If you do it this way, he won't be hostile, so it'll give you an opportunity to put all your buffs on before fighting him. Then you just need to walk back up to him, talk to him again, let him know you're ready. And the fight will then start, but you should be able to one-shot him before he pulls off any sort of attack. You can literally use anything you want here, you're going to one-shot him very easily. I just seized the opportunity to get another Tibia Summons clip because it looks really cool. What we're after here is the Shard of Alexander Talisman that he gives to you. And this talisman raises the damage of all skills by 15%. So this is another boost to the already preposterous damage of Ghostly Ignition on our Death's Poker. A lot of people don't realize that this non-boss Tree Sentinel variant will just stay up there and watch you buff and let you do it. So just use whatever buffs you want and then run up on him and one-shot him. It should be pretty easy with the Ghost Flame Ignition. And the only reason I'm actually showing this fight is for those of you that generally have trouble with this guy. Obviously he's not a boss so I wouldn't really stress if you're not one-shotting him. You could always use ranged spells or whatever you want to get past this. Now due to the nature of the fight with Malekith and how fast he is in both phases. 
For your sanity, I highly recommend you just use a ranged spell and maybe a spirit summon. But if you can pull off buffing and casting an explosive ghost flame on this ring in the middle of the floor, you can one-shot Beast Clergyman and Malekith with a single explosive ghost flame. And the reason that it works this way is because Malekith is directly beneath where the Beast Clergyman starts in the fight. So if you use a spell or skill with a large enough AoE, and it's enough to one-shot the Beast Clergyman, then it should be enough to one-shot Malekith in his hitbox right below the surface as well. Now when you get to the Ashen Capital, don't forget to grab that somber Ancient Dragon Smithing Stone by the Gargoyle. And at this point, you should be able to go back to the Round Table and purchase all of Malekith's armor, which is what I recommend for this build. Obviously, you could min-max each piece, but this gives you pretty good weight to poise and weight to defense ratios, and it just looks so much better than if you were to completely min-max and piece together from four different sets of armor. And that's not even considering how well it flows with the death theme of this build. Gideon is another very easy boss fight. You have the opportunity to use whatever buffs you want before even engaging in dialogue with him. And then even at that point, he doesn't immediately aggro. He'll sit there and go through quite a bit of dialogue, allowing you to do whatever attack you want. So use whatever you want here. I obviously had to take advantage of another situation that let me use the Tibia summons. Honestly here, if you're using Death's Poker, I doubt you even need more than one or two buffs. Now for Godfrey, I actually let him kill me the first time so that I could get the fight to this point where I would have a longer time to buff, waiting for him to walk all the way across the arena. And then from there, I just replicated what I did with the Golden Shade Godfrey fight. I baited out the axe throw attack and I followed up with the Ghost Slim Ignition from the Death's Poker. Now similar to Malekith, he's going to transition to his Horalu phase after a certain amount of damage. So you're going to need your Flask of Cerulean Tears before you can one-shot Horalu as well. Ultimately, as crazy as it seems, this fight actually isn't that difficult. You just do most of your buffs before going through the Fog Gate, do your Bleed and Poison after going through, cast Terra Magica, and then treat it like the Golden Shade Godfrey. Now at this point, the tutorial part of the walkthrough is over. You're at the Elden Beast. You can easily go in there and finish this game off. But I want to show you how to get another cool Talisman and one-shot Moog. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to Ordina. We're going to do the puzzle there. Then we're going to take the portal over to Mikola's Halic Tree, and we're going to work our way to Loretta. And with Loretta, you can actually buff by the door and then trigger the fight, run up and one-shot her with Ghost Flame Ignition. This fight may take you a couple of tries if her RNG doesn't line up and she tries to jump out of your Ghost Flame Ignition. Now immediately past Loretta, don't forget about the Ancient Dragon Smithing Stone in case you want that for another weapon later. And then there's a somber Ancient Dragon Smithing Stone on the bridge with the Avatar. And then the real reason we came all the way here was to come to this building above Melania so we could pick up the Dragon Crest Great Shield Talisman. Now this talisman increases your resistance to physical damage by 20%, so this is effectively the same as having 25% more health while you're out exploring between boss fights. Now I'm also going to say that Melania can be one shot in both phases. I'm not going to show the second phase because I'm challenging you to figure it out and if you do I will showcase it on the channel. So you need to make your way back now underneath the capital to the underground roadside and grab Moog Shackle which works exactly the same as Margit Shackle earlier. With this shackle, it's not only possible, but very easy to one-shot Moog. And this boss is a very good place to showcase the true potential of the damage of the Death's Poker. Now, I want to take a second to thank everybody that supports the channel and give a big shout out to our patrons. Now, in celebration of the DLC, we're going to be picking one lucky person from the comment section of each build video that we do between now and the release. This individual is going to receive a free copy of the Elden Ring DLC Shadow of the Erd Tree. Now don't forget to smash that like button and leave a comment below letting us know what you enjoyed the most about this build and what build you want to see next. Stay dangerous.